Morning, everybody. I th I've just about dried out. I had my second shower on the way here, being Melbourne. So, and thank you, Fred. Um, we have shared uh, one or two glasses of Great Australian Sparkling. So it's great to be here, and I'm I'm really glad that Simon asked the comment, the question about um, nature and nurture because um, I looked at the the question wall over there, and I accept the challenge, Fred. I'm going to, in the next 15 minutes, do the impossible and actually range across um, behaviour change, um, innovation culture. Uh, I'm not even going to use the term leadership because I think catalyst is way more important. But um, I'm going to look at uh, the kinds of capabilities that you've probably already got in your organisations that are hiding in plain sight and which, um, you know, coming back to the perennial issue of innovation culture, um, get put in the too hard basket and overlooked. And hopefully um, at the end of 14 minutes, you'll um, have a, a couple of um, tips and thoughts about how to do things differently and find the people that actually, um, yeah, louder? Yeah, yeah the, the people that can help lift your capability. So who are these catalysts and how do we find them? Um, basically, we need more diversity of thought and behaviour in our organisation. So what is an innovation catalyst? Well, thank you to Tendai for warming up the crowd and, and sprinkling some of the breadcrumbs that I'm going to pick up as, as we go through. Actually, the, it's who is an innovation catalyst? And there is so much resonance with what um, Tendai um, shared during his presentation. So. You all have your definitions of innovation. Fred sort of touched on high level things, so I won't go there. But, you know, to me, it's the creation of new value. And that can be anything from products and services to ways of working. Um, Catalyst is the interesting bit to me. And I've, my training is um, in journalism, so don't hold that against me. But I've been watching people um, for 30 years. And what really interests me is how we work together to create value. And over the past 10 or 15 years, I've zeroed in on those people, those individuals that have a particular set of um, capabilities that allow them to step in and catalyse a group of people around value creation quite uniquely. And, you know, to pick up on Tendai's point about the, the corporate innovation gap, this is something that we, I'm sure we all hear regularly, um, very high ambitions and yet pretty poor performance. Well... It, we, we Aussies love a competition, right? So if innovation is a team sport, but I hate to tell you, we'd be right down the bottom of the league table. If, to be honest, if we were to actually look at this in all honesty. Um, and to me, this is a real corporate risk that consistently gets put in the too hard basket. So my challenge to you is, let's do something about it. Don't wait for permission. Um, does everybody recognise this framework? Does anybody not recognise the Kinevan framework? Um, I'll, I'll just quickly go through some of the key points because I think you need a context um, to the kind of different behaviours that we're going to explore. Um, Dave Snowden developed this um, Kinevan framework and Sahil is going to talk about it a little later and Olga when they touch on complexity. But, um, you know, the, the, the world sort of um, does fall into four, roughly four different kind of environments and they require very different behaviours. So in the bottom um, left to your right, um, simple cause and effect is pretty clear, um, right is pretty self-evident, um, what, what Donald Rumsfeld would have called the known knowns. Um, so this is the area that's very process driven, it's, it's already being automated as we speak. If you move up on that right-hand side up into complicated. There's usually multiple right answers. As you came um, to the library today, you might have passed by the construction site. I was actually part of the, the winning bid for the Melbourne Metro project. And I had the, the opportunity to sit in the room with some of the world's best tunnel, tunnelers. They're a particular tribe, let me tell you, but really, really interesting hearing them talk, talk and debate. Um, in tunnelling, there usually are multiple um, um, pathways, well, you know, tunnelling alignments. So they, they do a lot of analysis to work out the best way to, um, you know, tunnel through the different layers of geology. Fantastic. And right under the library as we speak. 
So, they, so analysis is really important. Um, there are known unknowns, so they always factor in the things that they don't know, but pretty clearly um, they know this stuff. So expertise is king in the land of complicated. And you really want them to do their analysis, believe me, if you're in a railway station being built. And as you move across into the, the complex environment, which is where I'm sure a lot of you spend your time, now we're getting into the unknown unknowns. And this is where you're in the land of emergence where the, the, the whole situation is greater than the sum of the parts. There's a lot of things that actually you just don't know and you're never going to know. Um, there's a lot of unpredictability and Fred talked about some of the drivers of, of, of innovation, the high levels of uncertainty, um, you know, the, the VUCA world that you know so much about. And I, I think to me, what I'm reading and hearing about the AI, and I, like all of you, I've probably you've been on and played with Chat GPT. We are at the advent of a, a real roller coaster adventure, with, and that's just one element that's shaping the environment that we all um, work in. And we're going to hear more from Fiona um, about how to use some of these emerging tools um, later on. Pretty cool, in a very experimental way. So looking for patterns, experimentation. Um, so bang, 2020, remember that? I was actually very close to here um, doing a, a Catalyst event when the word came in that we were about to go into lockdown because of COVID. That's this quadrant, chaos. Do you remember it? Lots of people running around, actually heading home. Actually, a lot of people going to Dan Murphy's to buy booze before they went home into lockdown, to be honest. So, do you remember the fear, the uncertainty? Um, do, I, do, I, do I work? What do I do? So, just questions upon questions. That's chaos. Um, the only thing that you can do is chaos is, in chaos is try and find some sort of stability. But it was fascinating to watch as we started to move out of the chaos um, what was happening. And, and I'm sort of... You can only um, learn these things in retrospect when you look back. Um, and so as we started to stabilise, um, I saw these amazing upsides of, around how we work together. And for some of you, being Australia, a percentage of you have probably been in a bushfire or a flood or been bitten by a snake or something. Um, you know, you, you're thrust into these situations and you actually see emerging out of it new ideas, new ways of working, you know, the incredible capability of people to rise to the occasion. Um, and I, I certainly saw that through COVID. And so, I've, you know, I've, ironically, I was about to start on another construction um, project the day after COVID hit and we went into lockdown. And what I got told by the company was, oh, um, and, and we can't have people coming into the office, so we're going to shut down that project for now. You know, that looks pretty old school now, three years down the track, doesn't it? Um, so work from home, hybrid work, all of these new terms that have come through um, since COVID. It showed, I think, the value of uh, the social nature of relationships that Tendai was talking about. Everything is relational. Whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it, we get work done through our network of relationships and COVID really underlined that. Um, Vaccines were pr produced in, in a way that we would never have expected from the most unlikely competitive and collaborative um, groups of stakeholders because we had to. So you, you saw that what was, what was possible um, in the kind of the eye of the storm. Um, but we also saw, and this is another great opportunity, the fragility of the systems we operate in and try and make change in like healthcare, like childcare, like some of these social systems. What a great opportunity to make change. And what's happened since? We've tried to shut it all down in a lot of cases. So my view, we've got to accept that chaos is part of the mix and develop another set of behaviours about navigating that. But the possibilities of this are really, really exciting. And in order to do that, we need people who have got um, much um, deeper adaptive capability who are explorers, back to Fred's point. So I sort of like to think about the, this framework as having two sides. So this is just my interpretation, but 
you know, you have your problems on, on one side and you want to be more efficient. You want to be able to automate. You want to, you, you kind of know the parameters. But when you get onto the left-hand side, you're in the land of possibilities. So you don't know, you need explorers. You need a different set of capabilities. And what I'm about to share with you in four minutes, so I better speed up, is that actually you've got this capability according to the research in your organisation right now. So this is the analysis bit, yay. Give me a, a chunky problem to solve, fantastic. We all need that for efficiency. Um, this is the bit that interests me. I have no idea what to do, off we go. And have you been part of teams where that is the prevailing mindset? And we, we hear a lot about mindsets and they're pretty, pretty tough to kind of um, track down. But as you might have guessed, the people that we call innovation catalysts have a particular mindset. They love the messiness of that complexity that we talked about. So don't just take my word for it. There's, there's a lot of research out here. Um, I, I base you know, these views on um, adult development theory, leadership literature, complexity science, you name it, when you map it all over, there's amazing consistency about these mindsets. So this is just one particular adult development framework that some of you might be interested in. Um, the, if you look at the who's the biggest group in the middle, the experts and achievers, um, they tend to not do well in highly complex, highly uncertain um, environments. Um, ironically, um, according to the research, they also tend to hold most of the senior leadership roles. Do you see a link there? Um, but throughout the organisation, you're going to get people who are in the, the red, the individualist strategists and alchemists. And depending on what framework you use, they'll have different labels. We'll call them innovation catalysts. Um, they might be pirates. There'd be a lot of pirates there, I reckon. Um, they tend to hover around, they are native collaborators. I reckon if you go in across your organisation and find the people that everybody go to, to get things done, they will be your pirates, they will be your innovation catalyst. But they tend to not get picked up in the high potential talent pool because they're much more interested in the work than in a, a career path or whatever. They have a very different view of what interests them. And as you can see, the numbers are pretty small. Um, but the, the important thing is that they might have, is their mindset. And I love this quote. Some of you might know Tim Castell from the University of Queensland. He's called the Innovation Guy. Tim did this um, piece of research. And he's got a mate who's an extreme um, mountain biker. And he, this quote about, um, you know, don't you, hurt, don't you worry about hurting yourself when you're hurtling down the mountain. And his friend Ben said, well, if you see rocks, you hit rocks. And what Tim found in his research um, into um, perceived barriers to innovation was, if you think there are barriers, there will be barriers. If you don't think there will be barriers, there are no barriers. What innovation catalysts see is space and possibility. So the mindset to start with is really, really different. So I love also another quote from Jason Fried, the founder of Basecamp, about culture to answer one of a number of uh, uh, queries on the question wall. Culture is what results from repeated behaviours over time. So it's very hard to actually um, assess somebody's mindset. I think it's almost impossible, but what you can do is watch them and watch their behaviours, watch really closely. And I've been doing this for 15 years, just tracking some of the characteristics that I see innovation catalysts have. And we've already heard around, uh, from Chendai about their political acumen, their ability to build relationships really quickly. They also tend to be very um, diverse thinkers. Um, I call it sort of outside in thinking, but they use the range. They don't just use um, analysis, they use creative thinking. And we're going to hear from Mike about um, the importance of creativity later. But they use a range of things. They're much more open to using what's fit for purpose at that moment. And they're also comf comfortable with the discomfort of smashing some of those differences together in a team, which makes them fantastic team players who actually build capability just by turning up. 
Um, they tend to be boundary spanners. So within an organisation, you can spot them because they say, oh, I need, I need Simon and I need um, Sahil and that person, which is fantastic because they, they can bring people together, but in a corporate context, they might break the occasional rule and annoy people a little. So, you know, they need to have good sponsorship um, to do what they do best. They're very ex experimental because for them, this sort of exploration is actually like sacred play. It's, it's fantastic. And yet they're very, very good at delivery, but they deliver through others and with others. Um, so involved in that is a high degree of courage um, and I'm sure you know people like that. You might be people like that right here. Um, and, and that's really important as you go through the day, and we're going to end up talking about ecosystems towards the end. Um, these kinds of capabilities are absolutely critical in building sustainable um, ecosystems. So they are hiding in plain sight. Just uh, um, for fun, I looked at Westpac, um, one of the big Australian banks, 40,000 people. If you sort of extrapolate these numbers, um, you've probably got four or 5,000 people across Westpac who have these capabilities, um, these native capabilities. So if you're with Westpac, go find them. Um, at least in similar 1,000 people out of a workforce of 8,000. 8, the really good thing about adult development theory is that you can develop some of these capabilities, to your point, Simon, but you've already got people with these native abilities. So I think a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, if you find them, elevate them, give them a bit of um, space to go explore. They love the messiness, so give them messy. If you, if you have them in your team, um, don't try and tell them how to think or what to do. Just give them very broad parameters. Um, really listen to some of the questions that they raise because they ask questions in a different way and they might seem very unconnected to the problem you're trying to solve, but it might be that bit of insight that actually gives you that, that true breakthrough um, that you need. So, yeah, hidden value creators, um, a huge competitive advantage. Um, Tendai talked about coaching. Um, innovation catalysts do need coaching, but of a different kind, I think. But if you find them, love them, and they'll reward you in the culture. So thank you. I think I'm about to move. So, yeah.